Let's get started. My name is Dan Mogulup. I'm from the Office of Public Affairs, and I'm delighted to be here today at the third in the series of Campus Conversations with Vice Chancellor Administration Mark Fisher. This has become a very well attended and I think interesting and really valuable forum for campus leaders to meet with and talk to and listen to the campus community. I'm just going to do a brief introduction of Mark's background, um, and then he'll have a few words to sort of set the table, and then we'll be doing question and answers. So Mark is a graduate of West Virginia University, landscape architecture, was also, uh, also a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania's architecture program. He began working, it, it goes, his time at UC starts all the way back in 1987 when he began working at UCLA as a consultant and served as a director of design and camp, and he was campus architect there from 1995 to 2002, leading the design direction for a $2 billion capital program that included projects such as the California Nanosystems Institute, the Broad Art Center, and Kauffman Hall. Then uh, Mark moved over to UC Santa Barbara in 2002, where he spent 15 years. There also Vice Chancellor for Administrative Services, and in uh, that capacity, he reorganized the Administrative Services Division, introduced and rolled out a host of new technology services for the campus, led the creation of Santa Barbara's Long Range Development Plan, and established its first sustainability plan and more. So if you're starting to get the idea the guy is incredibly qualified for his current job, that'd be right. Um, Mark has served on numerous University of California system-wide committees um, with the Office of the President. He came to Berkeley in September of 2015, and if you'll remember, that was an interesting time to arrive on campus. Uh, 2017, sorry. Last September, in other words. Um, and in his capacity as Vice Chancellor of Administration here on the Berkeley campus, he oversees just about everything. Um, but it includes campus shared services, human resources, procurement, business contracts, and brand protection, IT. UCPD, facility services, parking and transportation, property management, and last but not least, of course, the Campus Sustainability Office. So, Mark, I just want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you. I'm not sure this, oh, I am turned on. Okay, great, thanks everybody. Thanks for coming out on what was a rainy day, but it's turning into kind of a beautiful day, it looks like, out there. Um, this is my third UC campus. Uh, each of the campuses is different, um, tied together by a kind of uh, similar genetics. And um, one of the things I like to point out is that um, while there are similarities, there are a lot of differences. And part of, I think, what makes um, someone successful or unsuccessful in a role such as this is uh, the awareness that each of these campuses is really different. Um, and yet, we have a lot of similarities that we should um, uh, always remember. It's great to be here. It's only been six months. I'm starting to recognize people in the room. I might not remember all of your names, but I will try to get to the point where I get them right. Uh, it's great to see those familiar faces here today and um, hope to meet more of you over the coming months and years uh, in my role here at Berkeley. Uh, an amazing place. So let's talk about that a little bit. So one of the things that Dan said, you know, what's different between Santa Barbara and Berkeley? <clears throat> you know, Santa Barbara is a relatively small campus. It is run on a very lean budget. Um, it has a lot to do with the way the University of California funded different campuses. It had the lowest funding per student of any UC campus uh, for the last 20 years. And with rebenching, there's some changes that are happening there finally that are very positive. Um, Berkeley, I would say, is very different. It's been on the higher end of the funding stream. So it has built into that a way of doing business that's different than I'm used to. Uh, a lot of that's very good. You can be much more strategic here, I think, than we could there. It's not a criticism of Santa Barbara in any way, shape, or form. It's just reality. So things that, like business process improvement we're talking about this morning, we really couldn't get to those sorts of things because we were so busy just trying to keep everything moving, all the bits and pieces um, aligned and operations moving forward. So there's a lovely opportunity here for me in particular to really be involved in something that is new for me. And that sort of process improvement and really thinking about how can we do things well in the future is great. It helps, I think, also to come from a place that's so lean. Because one of the things you see is, you know, I know we can do this differently because we did. And I know that, you know, resources are challenging. But I think the resources we have here are adequate to do a really uh, great job. And I think it's just a matter of us coming to um, a point where we've aligned the resources and the work that we're trying to do. Uh, in the smartest fashion possible. So it's, I think, one of our um, uh, big efforts, especially over the, the coming year, will be in, in those areas. Let's talk about how smart it is. So this is my third campus. 
<clears throat> and I hope none of my friends in, in UCLA or, or Santa Barbara hear this because I think that you have some of the most brilliant people on this campus of any UC campus, okay? So it's not just the faculty or the students, but the staff. I found with the staff on this campus, I, I get engaging questions, they're challenging, thoughtful. Um, to the staff in the room, it's really remarkable. I love my colleagues in Santa Barbara, no question, but I, I really am thrilled to get to work with all of you because I see um, a level of thought in this that is um, uh, nice, refreshing, interesting for me. So I'm, I'm, I'm really heartened by that, and as I meet you, um, again, I, I tend to be really um, amazed at just how, how bright this group of people is and how lucky we are to have all of you here. Um, you'll find as you work with me that um, staff in particular are very important to me. I look at you, if you're staff on the campus, as you're, you're, I feel a huge responsibility for you having a good experience here. So what does that mean? <clears throat> Things like staff engagement. Are we doing a good job? Is it inclusive enough? Are we being thoughtful about how we work with you? Are we making it fun in some way? It should be fun. You should enjoy coming to work. I like coming to work. Um, what are the opportunities for you here? And if not here, what are the opportunities in the system? Because I always say to folks, before you leave the UC, before you leave a campus, let's look for opportunities on campus, obviously, but if you decide the campus isn't right for you, what are opportunities within the system, including the Office of the President? It's a big, rich organization full of all kinds of opportunities for everybody in this room to do things. I'm a, a perfect example of this. I started out as a part-time employee in 19, no, 1995, and um, you know, never thought I would stay more than two years. So 22 years later, almost 23 years, I've had this remarkable uh, career with all kinds of possibilities and things that happened, and part of it was taking those opportunities and really running with them. So there's something in this for everyone, and um, if you ever want to talk about that on a personal level, I'm more than happy to talk about why this is such a great place to be and can be a great place for everyone here. Maybe um, we should get to some questions. All right. Um, I'm going to exercise my prerogative as moderator and toss you a few, and then we'll, we'll pick up cards. And again, as we go along, if people, other questions arise that you want to pose, just fill out the white cards and pass them down. So, you know, Mark, I remember you got here in September, um, right when we were beginning to deal with all the, or not beginning, or in the midst of dealing with the free speech week. And I, I couldn't help notice some of those initial meetings. It looked like you were saying to yourself, I'm not in Santa Barbara anymore. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, you're not. Um, and obviously, you know, a lot of what we did and the, the, the money we spent was about, um, you know, safety and security. And there were contra controversies and disagreements about the level of policing. And even recently, there have been other incidents involving UCPD. And it's a, it's a hot and important area yeah. in your portfolio. And I thought maybe you could just share a little bit about how you think about campus policing, what its unique attributes are, and what you hope to do with the department in concert with the chief in terms of its relationship to the community and its ongoing efforts and abilities to provide safety and security for the community here. First of all, we're lucky to have a great uh, chief of police. Margot Bennett's great. She has a good national, repu great national reputation. Um, we're very fortunate. I think on campuses, the most important thing is community policing, that the police department is really engaged with the campus, both you know, all faculty, staff, and students. Um, in particular, I think students, student engagement is really critical. Uh, you know, um, every police force in the UC is going to have, there will be moments when the police are loved and hated. Uh, I saw this in Santa Barbara, and, and, and remember there we had riots, fires, um, uh, uh, mass killing, all within six months. So we had you know, a huge arson case, we had six students killed. It was really a difficult period. And during the Deltopia riots, right afterwards, the students despised our police force. They thought it was too heavy handed. Then we had mass killings and they loved our police force. It's a very complicated job, there's no question. So for all the police officers, you know, we all should be really appreciative of what they do in terms of keeping us safe. Okay, having said that, we have to make sure that that same police force is so critical for our safety is also mindful of the fact that it's working in a very different environment. We're not a big city, we're a community. And in that community, how can we make sure that our policing effort is appropriate and is, um, you know, pr is tailored well to, to the community at hand? So Margo and I have had a lot of discussions since I've been here, everything from we're putting together a police advisory board, 
that will be composed of faculty, staff, and students. The students brought this to us. We think it's a great idea. Uh, we're growing that idea to include all three groups on the campus. It's not the police review board that has a very different legal um, role. This is really about how do we make sure that our policing does fit the community. Um, student policing, CSOs. I'm a huge proponent of the CSO program on the campus. When I got here, we had 19 CSOs. We had 135 in Santa Barbara. So we've grown that to about 50 or 60, I think, now. And um, I am committed to that being a really great way to police the campus. More eyes and ears than anything else. They don't carry weapons. They're students, just like the rest of our students. Um, they tend to be uh, well received by the student population. They can do a lot of good. They just having more people out there looking and seeing what's going on is helpful. We had a case last week <clears throat> involving a CSO that would have been much worse without the CSO. And I won't go into details, but having a CSO on the ground, out in our buildings, resolved the case much more quickly than it would have otherwise. And um, you know, it, it 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 saves a lot of issues for the campus having having that group. Um, on top of that, looking at things like um, our security force on the campus. What's the image of that? You know, is this the right image? Um, we should we should think about that. How how are they perceived on the campus? Um, policing in general. When it, when you have a big event, and I wasn't here a year ago, it's hard to argue that what we did this fall was right or wrong. Or let me rephrase that. It's hard to argue it was wrong because I didn't have that context, and I believe the response the response was probably correct given what Berkeley had been through. So you always, and I know it was challenging and they're triggering issues with this, but we came out of something very bad and we didn't want that to happen again. So this balancing of safety and the sense of safety in the, for the entire community is really critical for us and it's something we're just going to have to keep working on. Um, and I keep saying to Margo, and a big part of this is the image of policing and how do we temper the image of policing so that we feel safe but we don't feel threatened. And that's um, a lot of work for us coming forward. Thanks. Uh, another hot button issue is campus shared services. Uh, Chancellor has been very forthright when she talks about the extent to which it didn't meet initial hopes and expectations. In fact, one of the questions we got from the audience goes right to that. So talk to us a little bit about where we are in the whole process. We've heard about the regional model, what exactly that means, how it's going to differ what your level of confidence is that we can learn learn from the past and really have sort of a setup that serves the needs and interests of the campus and all the folks who work here. So there's been a lot of good work done on this in the past and I think the most important thing for everybody is um, the regional model balances governance, if you will, of service provision. So when CSS was set up, it has a tendency to be more isolated, I think, from the campus than is really healthy. So the new model, the regional model, there'll be six regions, five academic regions and one for the rest of us, um, will really be um, governed by both the academic endeavor and administration. So it's shared governance, truly shared governance of how this works. So we should have a better um, understanding of the needs of the academic community and make sure that we're making the right provisions and staffing and services available for that endeavor. Okay, it, the most important part of what we do here is the academic endeavor. So having uh, a, a service provision or provider that is not as tied to that as it can be um, is a challenge, and that's what we're really working toward. So the regional associate deans are a critical piece of this. Um, URSO's been up and running for years. It's a good model for that. The second region is the um, CHEM uh, MPS region, which is up and running, and, and that's also, I think, working very well. We have a good uh, uh, regional associate dean, that's Ron Cohen. We hired with him um, the, the executive director for that region, Samantha Yee, also a good hire. And I think that what's happening with that, they're working very well together. The region's coming together as you'd like it to. They're very thoughtful about what pieces are in the region or not in the region, how they're going to serve their client base, if you will, and um, how it's shaped. There, there are issues that I think folks are worried about in terms of where do we sit? Um, are we at 4th Street or on campus? And one of the things we're thinking about, trying to work toward, is having more people in close proximity to the folks that they're working with. So if you're in that chem MPS region, hopefully you're in a building nearby. So if a faculty member needs you, um, they can walk over to the regional office and talk to you directly. We're also talking about merging pieces of the team, HR and RAs together, so that 
there's a closer working relationship. So in many ways, taking something that could be looked at as being a little bit balkanized and debalkanizing it and really making it a much more integrated, both academically and administratively, but also <clears throat> across the team, a much more integrated model than we perhaps have um, in the past. And when you, what's the timeline look like for the transition? Oh boy. Okay. Sorry. So that's, that's not <laughs> such an easy question. Uh, there was an aspiration that this would happen fairly quickly. It will take longer than, than I think some would like. However, the critical piece here is to make sure we get it right. We don't want to make a misstep with this. So um, the second region, I think, is coming together nicely. Um, I think the Bio uh, College of Natural Resources region is beginning to take shape as well. And I think we'll start to see some progress there in the next few weeks. And then the professional schools are moving along as well. And theirs is probably the most challenging because they have nine deans. So they have to figure out how nine deans will pick an associate dean, first of all, what their governance structure will look like, how they're going to work together collectively in the future. So that's a pretty big challenge. Um, but I will say they are fully engaged. Um, the, the one group that we haven't gotten as far along with that I'd like is arts and humanities and social sciences. And we have uh, meetings coming up with that particular part of um, the campus to start to really uh, see if we can move that along as well. So there's no short answer. It will take um, longer than this June, I think, but I think you'll start to see real progress by June. Thanks. Then the sixth region, just if I could, is sure. just as critical as the other five in many ways. It, actually, I think it's $800 million worth of business will flow through that region. We need to make sure it's set up properly as well. And I know there's been some concern about which pieces ended up there, and uh, we'll continue to work with the campus to make sure we have that the right shape. And the, also, a similar kind of governance structure. So whether it's vice chancellors or whomever, we'll have a seat at the table and we'll be able to work together to make sure that we're providing the right services for the region. So I think that that whole subject is, offers a nice segue to another question that came from the audience, uh, given that we're talking about our future and evolution of systems and, and how we do business here. And this question is, how are staff being considered in the strategic planning efforts uh, in terms of staffing levels, skills needed, et cetera? And for those who may not be aware, the campus has now embarked on a broad strategic planning process with uh, involving the vision for who we want to be going down the road. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about how staff needs and interests are being accounted for and addressed and considered in that whole venture. Well, it goes back, I think, a bit to CSS and just thinking about what, what is the right staffing structure to support the endeavor. And part of this is redefining the endeavor, the strategic plan, is really thinking about what is Berkeley for the next 10 or 50 years, where are we headed? And I think there's a layer then on, that comes along with that where we really start to think about how do you get there. I don't know that we're far enough along in the process to really answer have we addressed the staffing model, but I like the question, and it's a good um, um, Reminder to me that we really need to think about that and move as soon as we have a sense of where the strategic plan is heading to layer on that very question to make sure that we have properly considered staff. So we're pretty early in the process. When did we start? January? Yeah. January. So it's a really quick process, and I believe it goes to the chancellor in April or May. Right. So soon. it's very fast. So, but we'll, we'll, I like the question, and we'll make sure that we keep that under consideration. So the next question really here is about the workplace itself. Um, and this is apparently there was some article recently on the internet that had to do with, I, I'm sorry, whoever wrote the question, I can't quite read the name of the website. But it was regarding workplace discrimination claims and questions that it raised about the campus investigative process and whether this person states whether we truly value an inclusive and equitable workplace. And so the question they pose is, what plans do we have to address this in a way that people will believe and trust in, and will believe that those who are in leadership positions on campus really espouse and live and practice the values that we give a lot of lip service to. Right. So Chancellor Chris, we all know, is very committed to this. Um, her entire organization is committed to this. And um, we're going to you know, make sure that we are mindful of this, that we really understand where the issues are and what we can do to resolve those issues and make it um, a healthy, equitable, fair place for everyone to work. Um, if we haven't done that, we will have uh, missed a huge opportunity, one, and also do a disservice to the campus and its reputation. I mean, the Berkeley's reputation is that of being an inclusive, forward-thinking place. We need to make sure and um, protect that. <laughs> I have a message in the chairs. And um, 
you know, I think it's, it, it behooves all of us to work to that end. I know that there's been concern recently about um, specific areas on the campus where this might be an issue. And I can tell you that my, my administration is really aware of that. Um, and uh, we are looking for ways to make improvement, whether that's where people sit, how they're organized, the structure of the organization, looking at all those pieces to make sure at the end of the day, uh, we really have concern, considered the, the staff um, experience and make sure that it is fair and equitable for everybody on this campus, that everyone's treated in a way um, that they feel good about. Uh, we have a lot of work to do here. You've seen the results of the engagement survey for this campus. They're not as good as I would like. You know, there are green boxes and red boxes. The campus has a lot of red boxes and very few green boxes. I came from a campus with a lot of green boxes and very few red boxes. Green is good, red is bad. So one of the challenges for me is to say, what did we do differently there? What can we do here to improve the situation? How can we make this a really good place for everybody to work? And um, so we're, we're aware of that and we're working on it and we know that we have um, not a lot of time because you know, basically that survey tells us an awful lot about the current work experience, especially if you drill down and think about all the different groups on campus um, uh, all the demographic groups on campus, the level of satisfaction is pretty low in a lot of areas, and we have some good challenges. And in that regard, do you, based on your past experience in other campuses, do you think it's primarily a matter of perception or substance, or what, what, have, what have you noticed here? When you say we have a lot of work to do, what are the areas that you think you, that demand that kind of work most immediately? I think communication is key, um, really having the campus um, involved in what's happening on the campus. Uh, part of it, I think, is a sense of isolation on the campus is not getting enough information. We had our first town hall, I think it was last week, it seems longer. Um, and I encourage all of you to participate in those processes. We'll have another one in the fall. It's a good, good source of information. What I'll be looking for in those going forward is really engaging you in the process. So if there are things you want to talk about in the town hall, town hall process, um, you know, whether it's uh, staff groups that want to participate, absolutely. I mean, that's the way I think we can open up lines of communication and make this a better place to work. If there are other things we need to do, um, uh, engaging staff directly in the workplace, happy to do that. This is a chancellor, we're really lucky, who's already done a lot of that. Um, we saw it over the holidays, I, you know, in facilities, the chancellor came to their holiday event, and um, they said that it never happened before. The tone, the mood, leaving the room was so much better, and I think we take advantage of what I look at as really strong leadership at the top that wants to be engaged, that wants to know what you all are thinking, and is really there to make sure that we make the best uh, work environment possible, and Chancellor Christ is really um, doing that already, and I think all of us will uh, be working hard with her to make sure that we um, are out, out with you as much as possible. And you, you know, feel free to tell us what, what's going on or what bothers you. Um, I always say in these meetings, my email address is really easy. My name is, is spelled M-A-R-C-F-I-S-H-E-R at berkeley.edu. It's very simple to get a hold of me. I read emails. I try to respond to them as quickly as possible. And um, I might not always have an answer, probably don't always have an answer, but if, if there's something I can help you with, um, do contact me and don't, don't be afraid to do that. So speaking of Chancellor Chris, the next uh, person who posed a question referenced something that she's talked about, which is our low tolerance for risk yeah. and how that influences our ability to think outside the box and the extent to which we actually um, can lean in and to address some of our problems with processes that we're sort of a conservative institution. So I think this person is really asking for your own assessment and how staff might be involved in that. Um, and, you know, in the context of sort of manda mandatory changes um, in order to, they seem really concerned about the ability to, to facilitate and implement change in the context of what is an environment that has this aversion to risk. How do you see that and what's your answer? Well, it's pretty process heavy here, I will say that. So um, uh, there's definitely a level of risk aversion that is uh, more so than what I've seen in the past. Um, having said that, I think you see why there's a pretty high level of risk aversion, so it's not completely unusual. I do think, though, looking at things like, we're looking at processes right now, especially going into this next, next fiscal year, like travel and entertainment. So there's an online travel form that, um, seems to be working. 
Uh, it may need more work. Uh, we need to be thoughtful about how it's rolled out, but I think it's the sort of tool that we'll really want to look at and say, how can this serve the campus well, um, move resources quickly, so if you have been on travel and you come back, how are you uh, compensated for the money you might have spent on that trip? And um, I think there's some very strong potential here to really use certain tools that take away a level of bureaucracy. And um, there's quite a bit of bureaucracy built into the current way of doing business here that I think we will need to simplify just to be able to meet the needs of the campus and provide a level of service that's commensurate with the quality of the place. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, let me just finish that off. Yeah, please. Your input's critical. So the piece I didn't touch in there was, if you have ideas or you think, oh, that's the stupidest idea ever, travel entertainment, don't do that, let us know. Because, or, and or, how we can improve it. Because there have been some comments, I was a faculty member last week, I think sent some really great notes through about how the travel form could be made better. That's good, that's great stuff, because if you can take that current tool, tweak it, and make it an even better tool, it will better serve the campus, and that feedback is crucial. Rather than saying, I hate it, I don't want to use it, why isn't it working, and what can we do to make that a really um, solid tool going forward? So we're talking about process. You've said a few times, let us know. What's the best way for people to do that? That's a great question, too. <laughs> you can always start by emailing me, and I usually know who, who I'd send it to in our organization. Uh, that's not always the fastest way, but let's start there. Okay. So I like to know what's going on. So um, Careful what you wish for. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I do have two email addresses. The other one is one called VCAT. I do not like that one because it, it doesn't get to me as fast. I really like the Mark Fisher one. So um, anyway. All right, here it comes. Flood in. <laughs> so speaking about systems, uh, this question is inter interesting, and I think it probably resonates with a lot of people. Any chance we can stop charging each other just to use another room on campus? Uh, <laughs> it's the little stuff, right? Uh, it's, a, it's just too much work to get approvals, and it doesn't really save or make money, um, on balance anyway, so what the heck? I, the, what the heck is mine, not theirs. Yeah. <laughs> So don't get me started on recharge. I think it's one of the weirdest things that was ever started in higher education. It just moves money in little circles. If it's truly new money, I'm all for it. Most of this is not new money, it's just circular money. And it's, it wastes a lot of time and energy and I think it's one of the great challenges here for us to really see how can we eliminate as much of this as possible. This gets back to how we core fund things IT efforts. You know, um, I think that looking at that very carefully is really important. What are the common goods that we should have on the campus? How do you fund them? How do you make that move forward? Then you can start to get away from these little circles of money and um, all the complication associated with it. So I'm fully supportive of trying to reduce that. And room rentals, there was one last week I think that we heard renting academic space that's not currently being utilized by the departments of their academic departments. What a bad idea. I mean, it's just, you know, it just sets up one more piece where um, is that really an appropriate way to raise funds? Probably not. And it just penalizes you know, our academic endeavor. You can't, especially as we've grown, as much as we've grown without growing buildings or other resources, using our space wisely is just critical. So talking about space, what, share your sort of assessment about um, the physical condition of the campus. Yeah. How, inside, outside, what you've been doing, what are the areas you're looking at going down the road? It certainly doesn't meet my standards, um, which the folks around me know. When you um, say it, what do you mean? Oh, the uh, condition of the campus, whether that be um, grounds, interiors. But I think we're making huge progress. So having said that, there have been some really good things happening over the past six months that I'm very proud of. So let me back up and say it, it didn't meet my expectations when I got here, but it's beginning to get closer to my expectations, which is good. And um, uh, again, the folks who are near me in our division will know that um, I pay attention to a lot of things I'm really interested. I try not to micromanage, but um, you know, I am interested, you know, if trash cans are overflowing or the grounds aren't in good shape, or I walk an academic building with a dean and it's in bad shape. We'll work on that, and we work on it very quickly. Um, the condition of the parking structures is something that's come up recently, and we're making a very concerted effort to try to clean up the garages. As I say, you know, it's, it's our first impression. Someone comes to campus, if the garage isn't well painted, it's not well lit, there's trash on the floor, what message does that send? It sends a message that Berkeley's a, not a very high quality place. And that's your first and probably your lasting uh, memory of the place. 
Uh, I'll, I'll tell you something my mother always said, you know, the front door is the most important thing. If your front door isn't well painted and the glass by the door isn't clean, that's the impression you have of someone's home. So this is a chance for us to change that first impression there. As you walk the campus, the campus should look great. Then getting into the buildings, uh, in, in order to support what you all do out there, we need to make sure that they're well managed as well. We have a lot of deferred maintenance. We're in the middle of a process right now, something called iCamp. It's a system-wide process where we look at, in detail, how much deferred maintenance do we really have. We say 700 million. I think of Rajiv, I don't think he's in the room, but he would tell you it's probably with seismic closer to 200, $2 billion of deferred or seismic. Two me. billion with a B? B, with a B. B, yeah. That's both for seismic upgrade and for deferred maintenance. And I think our deferred maintenance number will probably approach a billion dollars. So, um, you know, that's, that's big. However, we have found some resources. Um, we're beginning to make some progress out there. Uh, progress against a billion dollars worth of deferred maintenance is going to take a while for us to start to chip away at that. Um, but you can do a lot of little things along the way that will make it much more bearable to be in older buildings that really need probably total refresh. Um, again, making the work experience better for everyone, faculty, staff, and students. Yeah. So, so it's a big problem, but we, I think we're beginning to chip away at it. And um, there have been some structural changes in facilities I think are very good. Um, there's some new staff there that are incredibly good, actually. And I think as you walk the campus, you'll probably, I hope, you're seeing there's less trash. The grounds are more well tended to. And um, you'll see more and more of that going forward. Yeah. So speaking of trash, which sort of brings up the idea of recycling and sustainability is also yeah. in your bailiwick. What are some new initiatives going on there and what are your designs and intentions for that, that part of the, your operation? Well, Kira Stoll's in the back of the room, so she's the person in charge of sustainability for the campus. Um, that role was elevated just after I got here. Kira now reports directly to me. So sustainability is now front and center in terms of an, an important issue on the campus. I don't think that it was unimportant, but it now has a reheightened focus. And we're really, um, uh, we have some very big challenges ahead of us. One is carbon neutrality by 2025. Um, carbon neutrality means that you no longer really burn natural gas. If you're really going to meet carbon neutrality, um, everything on the campus would be electrified. Uh, it's impossible. All the campuses are challenged by this. Uh, Stanford spent $480 million to electrify their campus and got to 80% carbon reduction. Um, we won't get there without doing some things that are similar over time. And in the short term, we'll do things that the students don't like, like buying carbon offsets. Um, it's not a permanent solution, but it's a way to get to that goal of 2025. That's, by the way, a president's initiative. It's something uh, President Napolitano is very uh, convinced that we should do. She's committed to it. Um, and I think we have a lot of work to do in that particular area for our campus because we do burn a lot of natural gas. Uh, for our cogen plant. And now that we own and operate the cogen plant, it is our carbon. Before that, it was someone else's carbon. Mm -hmm. We now have a big carbon problem here to work on. So we're certainly thinking about that. By 2020, we're supposed to reduce our waste stream to only 10% that goes to the landfill. Right now, 50% of our waste goes to the landfill. We are actually, I think, at the lowest level in the UC in terms of trash diversion. Um, that sounds like a bad story. It's tempered by the fact that we've reduced our overall waste stream, and it's one of the factors that really needs to be uh, more carefully reviewed at the system-wide level. Having said that, we still have a big challenge. By 2020, to get to 90% diversion is going to take everybody in this room working really hard to make that happen. So what does that mean? You're going to start to see more um, recycling containers. I see some in the back of the room. In all your offices throughout the academic buildings, you'll start to see more of those big um, trash collection devices out on campus. They're called, um, what are they called? Big belly. big belly, thank you. I always want to call them big. They're called Big Birth in Santa Barbara, so they're Big Belly, right? And um, they um, do a couple of things. One, they sort the trash stream into multiple streams, which is great. They also uh, compact the trash so that the, it, it takes uh, less staff to keep them uh, emptied. Um, they're generally cleaner than a normal trash can. There's another positive benefit for the aesthetic of the campus. In fact, the newest ones have a foot pedal, which I encourage you to try because it means you don't have to touch anything with your hands, which is also nice for some of us who don't like to do that necessarily. So um, those sorts of moves are all going to help with this. Again, though, it's, it is a big challenge. The students are very engaged. Um, they're going to want you to be very engaged, and um, 
and faculty as well. So one of the, I think, big challenges will be all of us working hard together to get there. An extra complication of Berkeley is we're so porous. So if someone picks up something for lunch at, at say, um, Subway across the street on Bancroft, and they carry the trash back to campus, and I have some pet peeves with the way um, Subway packages things. They use a lot of material, I think. Um, when they carry that back to campus, that goes into our waste stream. It's very hard then to um, separate that out and say it's really not ours. So we need to think carefully about what our zero waste effort looks like and how we define the edges until the city of Berkeley is at the same place we are. And I know that they're trying to achieve the same goal, but we're not quite in step. And one of the things going forward will be working hard with the city to make sure that um, our efforts are well aligned. Thanks. Um, Circle back now to sort of staff issues. Interesting question here. Could the administration start a program that honors and acknowledges staff volunteer contributions on and off campus, uh, maybe even badges or community bonus points? And you know, I think this also reflects on a on a broader issue about workplace development yep. and just how we engage people who work here, not just in terms of what they do between nine to five or eight to six or in some cases, seven to seven, um, but you know, sort of it, all the things that they do as part of their public service commitments, and you know, as members of the community here. Short answer: Yes, I think it's a great idea. You know, <laughs> I you know, I think th this is one of the big questions for how we recognize um, uh, how long staff have been on the campuses. You know, I think in the old model, you don't get that first pin until ten years. Is that right? There's no really no recognition of how long you've been in the UC. And we know there's some generational changes for folks who may not want a career that goes for 30 or 40 years. And so I think recognizing staff earlier, um, more regularly, um, outside of that, that formal PIN process, um, it makes a lot of sense. And I think particularly for um, the millennial generation, being very thoughtful about how do we make sure this is a really great place to be and that they feel like we're, we're recognizing and honoring their efforts. So sure. I don't think Joe's in the meeting and in the room today, but that's something I can take back to Joe Magnus and talk about. Yeah, um, in that same vein, I mean, given the length of time that you've been at the UC and three different campuses, um, if you don't like the length of time thing, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> what do you? How do you characterize what? What are the commonalities staff have at the various campuses? I mean. I worked in the private sector and it seems it's very different in amazing ways, but I'm wondering what your own perception is having set at the apex of you know, the HR system and, right. and administrative systems on these campuses. Uh, one, a level of dedication. Um, I think staff, many, most staff, all, almost all staff, really believe in the place, um, believe in the endeavor, which is great, um, are committed to it. And really, and you know, it's fun, I think it's fun to be in higher education, frankly. Um, you feel like you've done something good, I think, at the end of the day, you know. Um, I was in the private sector long enough to know there are certain rewards there that we don't have here. <clears throat> On the other hand, um, I just can't imagine a 23-year career someplace else, frankly. You know, this is um, um, just a great place to spend a big chunk of your life, and um, uh, staff are really important in that. Yeah. Um, Across the UC, they really... I haven't seen a place yet in the UC where the staff haven't been really dedicated to the yeah. place. Interesting. Um, this plays into another question that just came up from the audience here, and it is that as more reductions in staff are requested or contemplated, how do you ensure the time-sensitive issues, especially in HR, that might not be addressed as quickly as mandated by law, won't cause an increase legal, won't cause le increased legal costs as staff doesn't have the bandwidth to sort of work on those issues? And I think. I would actually ask that you expand that into other departments too, that as we become leaner, um, that doesn't change the things we need to do is, uh, that are mandated by regulation law and, and UC policy. So how do, you, how do you address that? How do you think about that? So you definitely want to protect the core mission. And so making sure we have the right resources in place to um, you know, help serve the academic and research endeavor, uh, teaching experience is critical. <clears throat> Having said that, you know, we're going through, we're, we're in a tough year, I think Paul said this in his comments, that this is a particularly tough year in the, in the restructuring the finances for this campus. So we're trying right now to make sure that as we go into the tail end of this year, that we're really structured in a way that we're ready to, to, to handle um, some changing, frankly, on the campus. And um, the cabinet is uh, keenly aware 
of what, what we need to do process-wise and trying to make sure that we don't overburden areas of staff and that the process can be handled um, in, in a smart, civil way. And so we're very, very uh, conscious of, of what this, the demands are on staff. Taking that to a different position, making sure that staff, um, if it is a leaner environment, that the staff are not being asked to do things the old bureaucratic way, that we're really trying to reduce the effort so that you know, um, the staff can manage what they've been tasked to do in a way that is not producing unnecessary stress. So it really is combining both things and making sure that processes are properly structured and that we have the right staff and the right numbers in the right places. So, so I want to push back a little or just sort of focus in a little more yeah. on the bureaucracy issue. It's come up in a number of areas. I've been here for 14 years and it's like the weather. Everybody talks about it. Mm -hmm. um, there doesn't seem to be much that we can do about it. What do you think the keys are to actually making progress on de-bureaucratizing, if there is such a word, um, an institution that's as far-flung, decentralized, and complex as this one? Well, I think it takes broad buy-in. So I think, um, for example, in the shared service model, as we look at the regions, um, having the deans and the associate deans uh, co-own this with us will help us streamline processes. When it's somebody else's effort, you can say, oh, just let them do it. Oh, they're not doing a very good job, and I don't understand why. Well, you don't understand that they're maybe really understaffed. And I think that this regionalization will allow us to be better integrated into uh, the academic departments, and then really seeing where there are resources in the departments and in CSS, for example, that might be complementary, and how those resources can be uh, best utilized to get everything done that needs to be done, um, but also doesn't stress any one part of it. It's no longer them and us, it's us. And I think that's really critical. I think the only way to really take away a level of bureaucracy is, a, is, is changing the mindset to, um, um, it's, we're all together in this. So, but I think we're headed there, frankly, which is great. Yeah. Um, a lot of good effort. Something else that the, I've heard, I think we've all heard the chancellor talk a lot about, um, rightly so, is one of the key values for the university, and that's diversity. Yeah. How do you think about diversity? When, that, when you hear that word, I mean, that some people just think of it in terms of racial or ethnic or gender, or how do you think about diversity? Why is that something that's important for this campus, yep. for the UC as a whole, and what's happening in your realm in that regard? We're much richer when we're in a richer environment. When there's more diversity, will lead to a much more sophisticated, richer place to be. Um, and that is in all sorts of ways, whether it be um, you know, gender or race or um, ability, uh, physical abilities. All of those factors need to be understood, and um, we need to make sure that the entire community is really um, included in making this a, a great place to be. So um, diversity is a very important piece for us right now, I think. And I think Berkeley has a lot of diversity. It's a question of is it diverse enough in all ways, in, in all layers? And I think that's where I think we have some work to do to make sure that we really do have um, a diverse population that has all the right tools to, 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 to do what I did, for example. You know, how do you move up in the system um, if there are impediments, what, we, what can we do to change that? I'll, I'll give you an example um, from the Santa Barbara campus. We had um, uh, a lot of Spanish-speaking employees, especially in the services. And it, it came to my attention through um, the union reps that this was kind of a glass ceiling. And um, so we brought in the City College group to, do, to produce language skills, to teach classes in, 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 in English, uh, English as a second language. It was hugely beneficial. So you start to see the glass ceiling begins to erode because the language barrier is eroding. And um, it made a, a, a lot of difference for the employees and the engagement, staff level engagement there was, I think, a lot better because of this. So, and I'm not saying that's something we need to do here, although I have heard some suggestions that we might think about that as well. We did that on our time. Uh, the employees were paid to take the classes, essentially. They got college credit for it, which worked really well. Uh, for a lot of them, they hadn't gone to college. College credits and a little graduation ceremony meant a lot to them personally. So it was one of those things that we did that I think um, um, helped erase some of the barriers to uh, upward mobility. And I always say, if, if you're happy in your job, fine. That's great. You know, if that, if, and I, you know, there, I think there, there are a lot of very noble things that everyone does. If you're good there, that's great. It's if you want to move up and can't, 
that's a problem. And so to the extent that we can foster upward mobility for those who want it, then we need to work on that. And I think um, you know, that's probably true across the whole UC system, frankly. I want to circle back to something you said earlier, you know, that this is going to be a difficult, challenging year. Um, in your experience, how do, you think about, how do you think about adversity? What are the keys to institutional resilience? Um, and how do we make sure that we're both addressing and understanding concerns and anxieties that, can, that, yeah. that staff can hold during a period like this? It's a great question and something I would like to touch on. So um, if you look at the ad, um, administrative uh, endeavor on the campus, sort of the non-academic side, our cut this year is about $20 million, but that's not really the full number. It's really $36 million when you add into that merit and um, benefits increases. I'm going to be honest with you, that's going to have an impact. However, as we look at the numbers, it's not quite the impact that I thought it could be. It's not as bad a story. It's not a perfect story by any means. I'm not going to lie to you. However, there's some clever things that have been done that I think are really um, should be recognized. And one of them, and, and uh, Dan and I were talking earlier about um, bringing back the cogeneration plan. And why was that a good idea for the campus? And why was that a good idea in the context of all the other things we were doing? Why would you do that? And I think the question that had been posed was, uh, we buy cheap energy fairly inexpensively from PG&E. We actually don't. We pay a premium for energy, for energy from PG&E. I think it's about 20 cents a kilowatt hour. We produce energy at down around 8 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, by taking the plant back, we're actually saving energy cost. So ener saving energy costs means that we now have uh, a place to offset what might have been a staff reduction. That's a very positive thing. So I think it's really critical that we all think together about how we can do things like save energy on the campus because saving energy, I'll be really blunt, can save jobs. And that's just a smart way to do business. I'll personalize that. When you leave your office, turn off the lights. When you think of any place you can help reduce energy, think about this in terms of, hmm, my colleagues, you know, if I want to keep my colleagues here, I'm going to reduce my energy use somehow. And that, that energy footprint is really critical. Um, so I think there have been some very smart things done. I think in some of our areas in particular, um, there were positions that just weren't filled. So let's free the resource back up. Um, and or there are things we were doing that we don't need to do going forward, which frees up resources. So I think it's a combination of every clever thing we can possibly do to you know, maintain the staff that we can going forward, but with the recognition that $36 million is a big number still. So this is important. Yeah. Um, so we've come to the end of the questions in the session, which, and I really want to thank you for what were, what were forthcoming and candid and comprehensive remarks. And just thanks for coming today. Thank you. Thank all of you. And just to remind everybody, the, I think the final one for this academic year, the final campus conversation is on April 24th at noon in the same place with none other than Chancellor Carol Christ. Yep. Um, and look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you. Thank you.